one size fits all, said no woman ever. And it turns out that cancer is no different. Back in the 1980s, we all thought that breast cancer was one disease. Women got treated the same, mostly mastectomy. If they had a tumor that was a centimeter, they got chemotherapy. They weren't given any choices, their care was fragmented, and they were angry. It was about that time that I decided to devote my career to creating comprehensive care for women. And as I built the center, I wanted to add that essential ingredient to learn and improve at every juncture. Continuous improvement, always. That has always been my vision for medicine. And what has influenced me most are the people I've cared for, their stories, their experiences, and their outcomes. I listened. I want to tell you about Linnea. Linnea is someone I met in her early 30s many years ago. She was an incredible person. She was vibrant. She was a graduate student right here at this university in sociology at Berkeley. She loved to travel. She was a fierce Scrabble player. I'm sure she would have been a champion at Words with Friends. She was the first in her family to go to college. She was adored by her friends, by her mother, Evelyn, and her grandmother, Ertha. Linnea had lots of dreams and hopes, but they did not come to pass because she died of metastatic breast cancer before her 38th birthday. Now, Linnea's death was so, so hard for me. Every death, every bad outcome is hard. But it drives me, it drives me never to settle and never to say that what we have is good enough, because it isn't. We did not have the right drug for the right time for Linnea but it inspired me to start a new kind of trial, a platform trial to continuously learn, to accelerate the pace of change. Now, it turns out that what we used to do was we used to operate on people, or in fact, that's the traditional way. Surgery first, then give systemic therapy. But especially for these aggressive cancers, when you do that, you have no idea who's responding to what. And you can't figure out how to personalize care. So by flipping the order and starting with the systemic treatments first, we were able to learn who responded to what kinds of drugs. And in the past decade, we have tripled the chance that we could make tumors go away and bring new drugs in, and that has led to cure for these women. And today, maybe Linnea might not have had to die. But we need to know who's at risk for those kind of aggressive cancers or any kind of these cancers. We did not have that for Linnea and we don't have it today. Now, each of you may know someone like Linnea. There are hundreds, I know hundreds, thousands. But in truth, we could probably save those people if we knew. What if we could save half of them, even a quarter of them? I think about this all the time. Why are we approaching screening the same way as we did in the 1980s, when we thought breast cancer was one disease? That just does not make sense to me. Why don't we want an upgrade? You saw all this great technology today. This is the phone I used when I was an intern. No one would choose that today. And who wouldn't want to get in the pre-check line? Yes, we need to think about who's at risk for what. That's what we have to start thinking about for screening. Now, breast cancer is a very serious disease. In, 19, in 2021, 42,370 women died in the U.S. alone. You have cancer. Those three words strike fear into the hearts of those who hear those words and the people that love them. Breast cancer death is more common than death from car crashes. And it doesn't affect everyone equally. Black women are more likely to die than white women, despite the way we screen today. But there's another side to the story, and that's what makes screening so complicated. So we have to be smarter about the way we approach it. Every cancer is not a killer cancer. 
and fear drives over treatment. Every intervention has a consequence, and the complications of some of those can be devastating. One of my patients said to me yesterday, when she was told that she had stage zero breast cancer and was told she should have a bilateral mastectomy, she said, you know, I am tired of giving up body parts. I've had a hysterectomy, I've had my thyroid out. How do I know I really need this? And she's right. We have to be smarter. We have to be thoughtful. So every disease is complex. It turns out that some cancers are very aggressive and serious, and some are not. And we have to figure out who's got what. Now let's take an example that you all know. Allergy. You might have seasonal allergy and need to take an antihistamine. You might have an asthma reaction to, to ragweed and need to take an inhaler. Or maybe you have a fatal reaction to a bee sting and need to carry epinephrine with you. You get the idea. We need to know who needs the EpiPen and who needs an inhaler and who just needs some Zyrtec in their pocket. We need the right approach for the right person. We don't just tell women to go out and get a pair of size 8 jeans. We don't treat women with breast cancer the same, so it just doesn't make sense to me to screen people the same. Now, this graphic actually helps you to understand what I'm talking about. This is time on this hand, and this is the extent of disease on this side. You can see that this very fast-growing tumor, it's really hard with this screening each, each year to catch this tumor in time. And we used to blame women for coming in with these bad cancers. Oh, you let this go, what's the matter with you? But in fact, it's bad biology. We have to recognize that that's a fact. These are the cancers, tumor C here, where screening probably does the most. But these cancers that are really slow growing and maybe wouldn't come to clinical attention, we have to be careful not to overtreat these. But you get the idea. More for the biggest risk and less for those who do not. And then there's the issue, then there's the issue of callbacks. When you get called back for a screening, you think maybe that's nothing, but not to the person who gets called back. I had a patient yesterday, also, who called me up last night and said, oh my god, I, I, I think I have metastatic disease all over my body. She was called back for a biopsy, and she had had cancer in the past. But she had something really minor, and it turns out that three-quarters of the things that we recommend biopsies for are false alarms. And sometimes if people have two or three of these, these, these examples, they won't come back for screening. Or worse, they'll think they need to have a bilateral mastectomy, and people will do that. Now, that is not to say that we shouldn't be doing these things. I'm just trying to say there's a cost and a consequence. We have to be smarter. We have to be thoughtful. The things we do have an impact on people. You heard about all this great technology. Why can't we apply it and be smarter? Screening is a challenging problem. We need to know who is at risk for what so that tomorrow can be better than today. And how can we do that? We can upgrade and make improvements by putting everything that we've learned in the last decade or so to work. For example, there have been advances in cancer prevention that we're not applying because we're not routinely assessing people for risk. There have been advances in risk assessment, like breast density, like understanding your genetic makeup, it turns out that there are nine genes that you can inherit. If you have an error in one of these, you have a really high risk for breast cancer. But they're not very common. And then there's a bunch of other genes that by themselves don't mean much, but together, many polygenic gene risk, polygenic risk, they can actually upgrade or downgrade your risk quite a bit, and that can be very helpful. And it turns out that there are legal changes that make it so that you don't have to worry about discrimination from genetic testing. This is scientific information that you can know about yourself to help figure out what you should do and be forewarned. And it's so cool that the advances in technology, you've heard about some of them on the stage, we need to keep pace because this test has now come down to less than the cost of a mammogram. It can be sent to you in the mailbox with a tube in it, you spit into the tube, put it back in the box, stick it in your mailbox, and two weeks later, three weeks later, you can get that answer. We need to put all of this to work. So let's take an example. Let's take Kim. 
and Veronica. Now today, these two women would be given the same screening recommendation, but it would depend on who they got the recommendation from. The radiologist would say, these two women should come in at age 40 and screen every other year. Now the internists who are following the US Preventive Task Force guidelines would say, nope, they should come in every year at 50 and screen every other year. But I would submit that what we need to do is smarter, that none of these, neither of these two women should be screened the same. Veronica has inherited one of those genes that put her at high risk, 70 to 80% chance of getting cancer in her lifetime, and probably early because her mother died of breast cancer at 36. She should be screened alternating with MRI and mammograms starting in her 30s. Whereas Kim probably doesn't need to come in until she's 50 because she has no genetic risk, low polygenic risk, no other risk factors, and she could be screened every other year starting at 50 because she has less than a 5% chance in her lifetime of getting breast cancer. Now you may say, can we afford to screen women in their 30s? Of course, because we're not going to screen all women. It might be 2 to 3% of these women that we need to screen. And you know, screening uses up a lot of resources. Not that it shouldn't, but we estimated in 2014 that it was about, six, about 8 to $10 billion, that's with a B, in aggregate. And probably today it's over $20 billion. We can apply those resources better, more for the people who are young, who need it, that few small percentage, and less so we don't cause the negative consequences of screening for the people who don't need it. So what's the solution? The solution is to make screening better. To integrate risk assessment, screening, and prevention with a modern era trial, the five University of California campuses, that Athena network, we decided to put together a new modern online study, direct to women, regardless of where they get their care. The study is called WISDOM, Women Informed to Screen Depending on Measures of Risk. Currently, it's for women 40 to 75 without a history of breast cancer. And we're trying to compare the big idea. It's the same for everyone, screening every year at 40, versus a personalized approach, telling us when to start, when to stop, how often to screen, and with what modality, and if you're at high risk, how to reduce that risk. That's the big idea. It's a platform study to continuously learn and keep pace with technology. Now you may say, why a study? Oh, I don't want to be part of a study. But in fact, a study generates the evidence so that everyone benefits. If you treat one person, with something new and they do well, you help that one person. But when you introduce it in a way that you're studying and have the courage to say, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but I'm gonna generate the evidence, then everyone does better. As Maya Angelou says, the only way to do better is to know better. Every advance and every drug starts as a trial. Tomorrow's treatment's today. Now, not everyone wants to change. And it used to be that people didn't want to give up doing mastectomies. We used to do Halstead radical mastectomies, a brutal operation that left people disfigured, and people were afraid to change. But the studies showed that doing less was better. And women lined up to be part of those studies. They had the courage, as Zuriel said, to raise their hand and be part of that change. And every idea is not better. We have to have the courage to test it. When our treatments are perfect, then we're done. But until then, we have to work to make tomorrow better than today. Now, this is a graph that shows heart disease. The approach we're taking is done before. Here you can see how fast heart disease, I mean, it's taken many years, but the heart disease risk has come way down. It used to be that was the biggest killer for women, but now it's cancer. And how did they do it? They started with a study in the 1940s. They figured out who was at risk, who had that risk, what we could do to lower that risk, blood pressure, cholesterol, diet, exercise, and systematically brought down that risk. We can do that for breast cancer. We have to find out who's at risk for what the kind of cancer, what drives that risk, and then find the right treatment, the right prevention, and save lives. That is wisdom. You know, we don't have all the answers, but we're going to keep going and start the journey and go direct to women. But the study only works if women are really willing to partner with us, fill out the questions, stay in touch, talk to their primary care docs, and follow our guidance. Now, some say that won't work, but we say it will. We are 45,000 strong. We've got all the stakeholders at the table, the guideline makers, the consumers, the payers, because we think it's everyone's responsibility to make to 
care better tomorrow than it is today. We think the payers should want to cover the cost of a test that we think will make better quality and less cost, better health care value. Don't you think? Because evidence generation makes tomorrow better than today. Now, you may say, gee, that seems like such a monumental task, but I don't think so. If everyone does their part, if all of you, like Zuriel said, raise your hand and join, if you are between 40 and 74, you can join. If you aren't and you know someone who is, which I bet you do, they can join. Wisdomstudy.org. We want 100,000 women in this trial, and we want to be able to go Wisdom 2.0 to help those women in their 30s when we start to figure all those pieces out. And we want every race and every ethnicity, we want every woman to participate so they have representation, so that tomorrow would be better today. If we don't upgrade and we don't study it, then we're going to stay where we are. And that, my friends, is unacceptable. Linnea missed her 38th birthday. 42,370 women in the United States last year missed theirs too. It doesn't have to be that way next year or the year after. We can do better. We are fighting to celebrate more birthdays, and you can be part of it. So won't you join me? Raise your hand. Thank you.